which produces that flat trend line nationwide. So, um, so there's a lot more work we yet to do. So um, I'm glad you mentioned RCTs and body cams, which uh, incidentally I know are used here in Chicago, um, which is a bone of contention, uh, I believe, between the, the police union and, uh, and Mayor Lightfoot. But you mentioned there was an RCT, um, which is not really something that you can do for use of force policies. So from a statistical standpoint, a um, bit of a wonky question, I guess, but how do you find a valid counterfactual to endeavor to establish some kind of causality when you're looking at use of force policies, since there, there could be a lot of unobservable attributes of the cities which introduce these limits or don't? Absolutely. It's a huge question. Um, and there's no easy answer to this, right? I think, you know, as you know, in social science, there are uh, many things that we just simply can't know for sure um, because of the number of intervening variables. Uh, one, but what we do know is this, um, that over the past 40 years, there have, has been a thread of research, um, study after study after study that has looked at uh, the impact of administrative restrictions on police use of force, in particular deadly force. Um, so this are, these are the restrictions and use of force policies uh, and the impact that that has on police shootings. Um, early on in that research, so this really started with a professor uh, in New York uh, named James Fife, who studied the NYPD uh, and their changes that they made to their use of force policy, again, in response to a high profile police shooting and mass- massive protests that actually happened in the early 1970s. Um, and this really was one of the first sort of like a landmark study that began to look into changes that NYPD implemented, banning shooting at moving vehicles, uh, requiring officers to use alternatives rather than deadly force, um, that as soon as those changes were implemented in, uh, I believe, 1974, we saw a, a police shootings, which had gone up every single year before that, uh, began to decline, and actually declined ever since uh, in New York. So now it's a far smaller number of people who shot by police every year than were back then. Um, since then, there have been studies that have looked at uh, a number of other jurisdictions. So Philadelphia, Cleveland, uh, Detroit, uh, LA, uh, a range of different jurisdictions. And I've shown um, that after implementing stronger use of force policies, um, there have been declines in police shootings following that implementation. Um, again, this isn't a randomized controlled trial. There's, there could be a, a range of different intervening variables. Um, what we then showed in 2015 and 2016, uh, we looked at the 100 largest cities in the country. So this was really just expanding on the existing research literature by applying it to a lot larger number of police departments um, and looked at the level of restrictiveness of the use of force policy uh, taking into account the restrictions that were recommended by the Police Executive Research Forum, uh, the Department of Justice, a range of other sort of uh, like standard restrictions that have that there has begun to have a, commence, a consensus emerging around, um, and found that the police departments that had more restrictions in their policies uh, were significantly less likely to kill people in those jurisdictions that did not have those restrictions in place. Um, what we actually have been able to show now because we've had a lot, uh, you know, a number of additional years of data to work with, um, is that those jurisdictions that implemented changes to their use of force policy to make them more restrictive uh, since 2013 have had the largest reductions in police shootings, both fatal and non-fatal, um, and that many of those restrictions uh, occurred as part of either participating in, uh, you know, the Department of Justice Collaborative Reform uh, Program, uh, having a Department of Justice intervention. Uh, through you know the a, a DOJ pattern and practice investigation and consent decree, um, or were departments that just uh, on their own initiative, often in response to community pressure, changed substantially their use of force policies um, and made them much more restrictive. And we've seen that even when you control for things like arrests, uh, uh, you know assaults on officers, uh, crime rates, and a range of other aspects, um, that the actual use of, the use of force policy change remains significant. Uh, as an explanatory variable in in the decline in police shootings in those jurisdictions. Um, So again, this is something that is very, very hard to study. It's very, very hard to say for sure. Um, But there's a lot more evidence that making those policies more restrictive can impact police violence than there is evidence in support of things like implicit bias training or body cameras. Um, And it sort of makes intuitive sense as well. I mean, you know, this is a uh, this is almost, you know, akin to the broader gun violence conversation, where you know, there's a whole bunch of research showing that states and cities that have more restrictive laws on gun ownership uh, have lower rates of gun homicides. 
Um, and it's not much different here. The, the cities that have more restrictive laws on police shootings and police gun violence have lower rates of police gun violence. It's just not, um, it's not sort of like rocket science, the theory. Um, and more and more uh, with each additional study, we're seeing the impact uh, that those policies can have. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I'm very interested in talking about the relationship between uh, debates around gun control and American gun violence in general. Uh, America has one of the highest rates of gun ownership in the world. And the Second Amendment is a uniquely American uh, creation that sets it apart from, I think, most countries. I, I'm myself, I'm from Kenya. And so uh, understanding gun culture and gun violence in America was, uh, was quite a culture shock. Um, so how do you see the link between America's very unique relationship to, to guns, uh, which results in high gun ownership rates and also very little gun control regulations? And what, how do you see the relationship between that and police violence? Is, uh, are they part of the same issue? Um, are police killings, in, in your view, inherently linked to uh, America's uh, relationship to guns? So, so I think that that's it's a really complicated question. I think there's no doubt that uh, the presence of so many firearms in the U.S. Uh, is contributing to high rates of gun violence in general. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of police who will cite the number and the, the rate of gun ownership in the United States as a, uh, as a reason why they are sort of on edge and more likely to pull a firearm and believe that their lives are in danger. Um, there is some emerging research that has also looked into uh, rates of gun ownership and rates of police violence at the state level and have also found uh, that states that have more gun ownership have higher rates of police violence. Um, so, so I think they, they, there is a connection there. Um, I think it's clear there is some sort of relationship uh, and it becomes more difficult to advocate for things like, you know, having police be unarmed, um, like as the ma vast majority of police in like the UK, for example, are um, you know, like just not having a gun. Uh, it becomes difficult to fight for those things in a context where there are a lot of people with guns, a lot of civilians with guns. Um, at the same time, I think what is also clear is that there are a whole bunch of police shootings and other deadly force incidents that don't involve people with guns. Um, and there is no excuse for that at all, right? I think, uh, you know, when you look nationwide, about half of the people killed by police uh, had a gun and, and were alleged to have you know, been using it in some way or reaching for it. Uh, and this is based on, predominantly based on the police narrative, so that's probably uh, overestimating things a little bit. Um, but you know, the other half of people did not have a gun. And in any other country, um, it would be highly unlikely for the police to kill that person. Um, you look at a country like Japan, with you know about 140 million population, uh, huge country. They haven't had anyone, uh, any civilians killed by police in the past decade in Japan. Um, and it's not like they're not dealing with people who have knives or baseball bats or who are unarmed and you know fighting people. Like all of those things the police deal with routinely in contexts like Japan, in contexts like the UK, uh, in, in, in much of Europe. And nevertheless, the police do not kill people uh, it's exceedingly rare for the police to kill people in those circumstances, whereas in the U.S., um, it's almost treated like uh, like if the person had a knife or if the person had, let's say, a bat or a stick or even if they were unarmed, but, you know, they were alleged to have been punching somebody or something. Uh, there's almost an assumption that, uh, that the police were justified in killing that person, uh, whereas, you know, anywhere else, uh, you know, in uh, in in the rest of. Uh, at least among wealthy nations, right? There, it's very rare to see the police actually do that. Um, I was actually in a, a, a cab in London, and the man who was driving the cab, he asked me what I did. We started talking about uh, policing in the U.S., and, and he was saying, you know, there was this case that I saw recently in the news, and you know, there was somebody who just had a knife, and the police shot them, and uh, it didn't make any sense to me. And I think in that moment, I just sort of realized how the culture in the U.S. is so different that uh, people really just assume that if the person had, the knife, had a knife that the police were justified in killing them. And that's not always the way that uh, that things have to be. It's not the way things are outside of the U.S. 
uh, and it shouldn't be the way that things are in the U.S. So recently, researchers at UChicago received $1.2 million from the National Collaborative on Gun Violence Research to develop a police training program. And um, some of that is spearheaded by Harris professors uh, like Andre Dubé. And they're working with the Chicago Police Department to increase police safety and community safety by training officers to process high stakes situations more completely and more accurately. Um, so this is supposed to allow officers to make better decisions and reduce the extent uh, of excessive use of force, including uh, officer involved shootings. What do you what are your initial thoughts on this approach um, in terms of training uh, police officers on situational decision making? Um, so, you know, it's tough. I, I don't know. I think the problem with training is that it's very difficult to study the impact of police training. Um, like methodologically, it's very tough because there are so many different training models. Uh, the qualities of the trainings vary. The things that are required to be uh, as p- a part of that training depend, like the modules depend by city, they depend by state. Um, the impact that the training has, it's very hard to isolate the impact that participating in a training for a particular officer would have versus another officer. Um, We do know that trainings can change police attitudes. Uh, You know, implicit bias trainings can impact, you know, police attitudes on race and other issues. Um, But we just haven't seen conclusive evidence that trainings are changing police behavior in ways that reduce use of force. doesn't mean it's not happening. It's very hard to to establish uh, methodologically. And I think, you know, one of the I'm hopeful that this training can make a difference. I am also mindful that uh, one of the things that we know we can do right away is actually scaling back the role of the police in responding to a range of, of types of situations um, that can be handled by uh, you know other providers, mental health providers, uh, you know social workers, community uh, gang intervention uh, outreach workers. Um, and I think like the you know so if if I were making an investment, uh, in addressing police violence and reducing police violence, that uh, that investment wouldn't go towards you know training the police. It would go towards uh, scaling up models, responder first responder models that don't involve the police, um, that just have no likelihood of escalating to deadly force because the people intervening uh, are not using deadly force. Um, so you know you look at the Cahoots model in Eugene, Oregon, for example, um, and you know they have a huge number of their uh, 911 calls are now diverted to mental health providers who are the first responders uh, for incidents, you know, that may involve somebody having a mental health crisis or homelessness or a range of situations that police currently uh, are involved with and oftentimes involve themselves in ways that escalate the situation further. That's really, uh, that's really helpful, really interesting. Uh, I wanted to go back a little bit to um, talking about, you know, driving change and getting buy-in. Um, and, you know, you mentioned our federal system and how it makes it often difficult to get sort of large changes, although on the other hand, you have uh, the possibility potentially to get quicker change um, on a smaller scale. Um, I'd love to hear where you feel like um, you've seen real differences being made uh, and whether you've come up with like a theory of change over the last few years that you've been doing this. Yeah, so um, I think first and foremost, what is important for people to know is that there have been cities, there have been uh, large areas of the country that have made substantial progress in reducing police violence, uh, particularly when it comes to deadly force. Um, And that is true in places like Oakland, uh, where the city went from an average of between seven and eight police shootings a year, uh, just, you know, six or seven years ago. And, you know, every single year prior to that was set between seven and eight police shootings. And then dramatically reduce it now uh, to now it's between zero and one police shootings a year over the past three or four years. Um, And that's substantial, substantial progress, lives saved. Um, As I said, you know, in the largest cities, the largest 30 cities in the country, there's been a reduction of police shootings by 40 percent. So change can definitely happen. It is happening in some places, uh, some places more than other. Even Chicago, you know, Chicago uh, police shootings have gone down, I believe, about 70 percent since 2011. Um, which is huge. Um, and looking at all of those changes, looking at the places that have reduced police violence and examining some of the factors, sort of the ingredients as you're uh, referring to, um, that actually can pr- can produce change. Um, there are a couple of things that come to mind. First and foremost, uh, organizing matters, right? I think uh, 
uh, when you look at the places that have made changes, there are there are larger cities that have.